Hello and welcome to worship. My name is Marcia Staub and I get the awesome opportunity to serve as the kids minister here at FBC Tifton. Whether you're joining us in person or online, it is a great day to worship the Lord. If this is the first time you're joining us or if you would like us to provide you with more information about us, take some time and fill out our connect card. You can find that at fbctifton.org connect. That's just an opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about us and for us to learn a little bit more about you. Before we begin in worship today, I would like to make you aware of a few things we have going on around our church. VBS is coming. It is June 5th through the 9th, and we are going to be prepared to blast off and learn how to shine Jesus's light throughout our universe. If you have a child who has completed pre-K through fifth grade, you can register them at fbctipton.org slash events. And if you're an adult or student who would like to be a space guide, you can register as well to serve and invest in the lives of kids during VBS. It promises to be an awesome week where we get to hang out and teach children about the gospel. Next up, we have our 519 Gospel Group. This is a music and worship opportunity for people who love to sing. We're gonna be learning some gospel songs and preparation for a block party to present the gospel. So if you're interested in worship, please plan to join us on Wednesday night for 519 Gospel Group at six o'clock in our choir room. Next up, we have summer small groups this summer. These are groups of people who are intentionally investing in each other in a discipleship relationship. And we would love for you to join a small group. There's no better time than the summer when there's a few extra hours in your week to check out a group and join those. You can check our groups out at fbctifton.org slash groups. So now we're gonna prepare our hearts for worship. If you're joining us online, grab your Bible, grab your pen, and prepare your heart to hear a word from the Lord. If you're joining us in person, come on into the worship center and prepare your heart to worship our Lord. It's going to be an awesome Sunday.
this morning? Good, good morning. I want to pray for you, and then we're going to worship together. I'm so glad that you're here, uh, willing to worship with us. If you're joining us online, thank you for hanging out with us this Sunday morning. We're going to worship Jesus for who he is and what he's done. Let's pray. Father, you are so good and so faithful. And this morning, we, we just want to take a few minutes to honor you for, for who you are and for what you've done. You have radically transformed our lives. So for just a few minutes, we want to offer back to you, God, worship and praise and song and instrumentation, all the things you've gifted to us. We just want to, God, throw them back at your feet because you're worthy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed. And God, we believe. It. Yes, we can see that. Wonders are still what you do. And bodies are still being raised. And giants are still being slain. And God, we believe. It. Yes, we can see that. Wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. Yeah. 
First family may take a seat for just a minute. Hey, welcome to the connection service here at First Baptist Church. Tifton, my name is Matt, and as always, we have a few things we want to share with you, but the first is this, is we believe that life is better connected. I know we say that a lot, but we believe it. That's why we say it. And so on the seat in front of you, there is a connect card. Simply fill that out, turn that information to our guest desk, and there we will help you get plugged in to the next step with a faith family. Announcements for you is this, is we were having our VBS. It's coming up in a couple of weeks. It's crazy, but we're here, right? Summer is here. So VBS is coming up in a couple of weeks, June 5th through the 9th. If you have kids and they are not signed up, please, please, please. This is an amazing opportunity for them to continue to build foundational development and understanding Jesus. And so sign them up online. If you have questions, come find us. Look, Marsha and the kids and men team do an excellent job every single year of the VBS. So sign them up for that. Secondly, the 519 chorus. If you have a gift to sing, if you have a gift to even connect with people, if you want to be a part of a group that wants to engage the community and, and be the church outside of the church, this is an opportunity for you. And so go online, sign up. Barry and his team are going to do an excellent job. They're already starting to practice now. And um, that way you can help get plugged in and just sing songs to Jesus and about Jesus to the community of Tifton. And then lastly is we have our summer small groups that are about to, to start. They're ramping up. And so again, if you want to get plugged in, we want you to get plugged in. We want you to, to connect with others. And so online, there's a list of small groups. You can join any of those. They're about to start up here in the upcoming month of June, and then we'll be good to go. All right. So what we're going to do is we transition back into worship. I'll pray for us, but we always have a time of response through giving. We say it every week because we believe it. We want to be glad, generous, and grateful givers. And so behind me on the screen, there's always three ways to give. The ushers are coming forward to pass the joy bucket. So let's go ahead and stand. I'll pray for us, and then we'll continue with worshiping the King. God, we know that, that you are moving. You're moving constantly. Jesus, you are not a passive God. You are an active God. And so, God, we thank you for continuing to do what we cannot and that's continuing to, to transform us, to sanctify us, to mold us into a reflection of your glory. And Jesus, we thank you that you are still in the miracle business of bringing people from death to life. And so this morning, God, help us to connect with you. Lord, this morning, may you bring someone from death to life because you are worthy. And Jesus, we want to give it all to you. So Lord, we thank you. We praise you in your name. Amen. generations falling down in worship sing the song of ages to them and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the lamb come on his name is the highest your name is the highest in your name is the greatest in your name it stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions in your name it stands above them all Song forever to me. 
Come on, sing it out. When did I start to forget All of the great things you did When did I throw away faith For the impossible And how did I start to believe You weren't sufficient for me why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? You are more than able. You are more than able. Yes, you are, Jesus. You
We just want to sit at your feet this morning. God, laying all the distractions aside, Father. You are the medicine, the only cure for everything I feel within. Redeeming what was lost and all that. truest friend this morning. You are the truest friend. Staying through the night when I was at my end. Comforting my heart till it was light again. Oh, the sea is a faithful kind of love. Come on, every voice in this room. You are the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us, you're here right here with me, and wonderful Counselor, the government is resting on your shoulders. You are the Father.
You're here right here with me. Come on, he's here with us. Wonderful counselor, the government is resting on his shoulders. And you are. Oh! 
I just want to sing that one more time as a faith family. And so precious is that flow. Come on, you don't need us this morning. Single precious and so precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other found on love, nothing but. more time sing nothing oh nothing but your blood oh Jesus can we give him praise today hallelujah father we thank you for this morning God we thank you for being our wonderful counselor our Prince of Peace. God, the one who is faithful to the end. God, we thank you for this morning that we get to stand here, God, and just glorify. God, magnify who you are. God, and what you've done for us. God, we ask you at this time that you would bless the word, Father. God bless TJ as he brings the word, Father, and let it be your words through him, Father. God, nothing but your blood. God, we say thank you. Thank you. We ask all these things in your precious, mighty, and holy name. And everyone said together, amen. You guys can be seated this morning. Amen and amen. How we doing? Good. Oh, happy Memorial Day weekend. I want to honor today um, the service members, those who have paid the ultimate price, and ultimately um, those in the room and, and looking to Jesus who's paid the ultimate price for all of our lives, those who will come to him in faith and repent. So I just want to say thank you um, if you're part of that brotherhood this morning in the room, walked in those shoes I do want to say today, uh, as, as we launch into the last value of the, the first six values, uh, or the last value of the six values that we hold as a church as our core values, a lot of values in this, uh, today what I would love to do, if you know, um, if, if I were to tell you that, that we put together um, a $1,000 gift card for anyone that can recite the last five values leading up to today, what would happen? Anybody in here? God, I, we don't have a gift card. I'm just playing. I'm just, just kidding. But if we could, I would be highly impressed. Today, what we've done over the last six weeks, we, we've talked about who we want to be as a church, the kind of culture that we want to build as a faith family. We talked about beginning with growing spiritually. What does it mean to grow spiritually? And then we went into gather intentionally. And then we talked about giving generously. A few weeks ago, we said we want to live missionally. And then last week, we talked about serving faithfully. And today, what I want to do for just a few minutes is talk about what it means to lead selflessly. I'm going to read you a passage of scripture from 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to pray together, and then we're just going to dive in. 1 Peter chapter 5 says it like this. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed Hear this, underline this, highlight this, put some exclamation points, little stars in your Bible, doesn't matter. Just think on this. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but 
eagerly, not dominating over those who are in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Let's pray together and we'll get after it. Father, you are the greatest of all time. There's none like you. There's never been any like you, and there will never be any like you. You are infinitely better than anything we can experience on this planet. And Lord, I can declare, God, you are better than any success. You are better than any infirmity. You are better, God, than any triumph, and you are better than any difficulty. So God, I pray this morning that your faith family, as we sit and hear the word, that we could see the better, Lord. No matter what we're walking through this morning, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we brought into this house together, I pray that you would let our eyes see our ears hear and our hearts receive the better. And that's you, King Jesus. Only you can do that, God. We can't manufacture the moment, God. We can't make it happen. I can't preach anyone into your kingdom this morning, but you can open up the heavens and pour out a blessing today. So I look to you, King Jesus, to do what you always do in the way that I've always said it, Lord, knowing no other way. Just do, do work, Lord. Just do work. And we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. This morning, I want you to track with me. I'm going to give you a point, and then I'm going to give you four subpoints, and there's going to be some other points and some subpoints. So you got to pay a lot, of, a lot of attention this morning, okay? Point number one this morning. It's interesting to me that as Peter is talking to the church, those in the dispersion, he's encouraging the church, he's lifting up the church, but he's, he's keying in on this idea that they should shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Point number one this morning, I want you to hear this, I want you to remember this. Everyone has been trusted by God to lead someone. Everyone has been trusted by God to lead someone. Now, some of you say, oh, TJ, I'm not a leader. When you hear the word leader, even, you think of like Martin Luther King Jr. and his I have a dream speech, or you hear of, or think of Ronald Reagan, and you, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. You think of these iconic moments in history of these great leaders. And so you think, well, surely I'm not a leader. I, I don't have these iconic moments, but hear me say this. Everyone in the room has been entrusted someone by God to lead. If you're a mom or dad in the room, God has gifted you with children that are your responsibility to lead. It can't be left to the government. It can't be left to the education system. You have to lead them. Husbands, if you are married and you took on the responsibility to marry a woman, to bring her into your house, to commit to love her in sickness and in health, it is your responsibility to lead her through gracious submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Bosses in the room. If God has gifted you to have people under your watch care in your job or in your place of employment, God has gifted you someone to lead. So nobody in here, you, you got a friend? God has given you friendship so you might have the opportunity to lead someone. No one in this room gets to leave today and say, oh, I'm not a leader. That's, that's for those like talented or special people. No, like <laughs> we're all trying to figure this thing out together. And we're all leaders. Everyone in this room has been trusted by God to lead someone. And I, I want you I want you to think of it this way. If you're a parent, these are precious gifts from God's heart into your house to lead. If you're a spouse, this is, God has given you a helpmate with a responsibility to lead. If you work in an office, you are coaching a team. Like, listen, we can stretch this out as far as you want to. You got a hobby and you and your buddies go fishing on the weekend and you all play some golf together, whatever. God has gifted you relationships so that you might lead them. You say, TJ, if that's true, then what is a leader supposed to do? What, what, what does a leader look like? So what I want to do under this first point is give you four subpoints this morning of what a selfless leader. I want to give you the picture of a selfless leader. Number one. A selfless leader provides. Proverbs 3, 27 says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it's due. It is if, when it is in your power to 
do it. It is our responsibility. If we aim to be selfless leaders, it is our responsibility to provide for those under our watch care with the most beneficial things to them for all eternity. Hear me say this. Praise God, we can provide food, we can provide houses, we can provide friendship, but hear me say this this morning, the greatest thing that we can offer the people that we're called to lead is the word of God and love. This is the only thing. You say, what am I supposed to provide? TJ, I don't know what to provide. Yeah, give them the word. <laughs> like, give, give them something that's going to spiritually last and never be spiritually corrupted and never fade. You say, TJ, how do I love my kids well? Give them the word. How do I love my wife well, my husband well? Give them the word. How do I love my employees well? Give them the word. How do I love my friends well? Give them the word. And then hear me say this, live the word in front of them. Don't just provide the paper, but be the example. Because selfless leaders provide, and they provide that which is necessary for life. Yes, clothing, shelter, food, but ultimately one day we're all going to breathe our last breath and we're going to return to the dust of the earth. And the only thing that will matter that you pass on to the next generation is the Word of God. It's the only thing that will stand. The only thing that will not be correct, it's quiet in here, so I know like, you're like, geez, this is Memorial Weekend, like we're partying. No, just hang with me. I know this seems tense. It's going to get more tense, just to let you know. Let's dive in. Point number two, a selfless leader defends. A selfless leader defends. One of my favorite parts of Scripture, when I, when I think about David, I think about this battle that he's about to have with Goliath. You look at the Old Testament. It's a story that we all learn, most of us, in Sunday school, which is really interesting. You think about, like, this teenager kills this giant, cuts off his head, and he's like, yeah. I'm like, we taught three-year-olds that. You know what I'm saying? Crazy. Anyways, this is a really cool part of the story. He's getting ready to go to battle. And he's suited up in all of Saul's armor. And, and you can imagine, like, this little guy, this little teenage guy with this in the armor of this guy that's like a, a foot taller than everybody in the kingdom. And he's just this giant. He's overwhelmed. And, and he's just convincing Saul. Like David is convincing Saul, let me go and defend God's people. Let me go and defend God's name. And he's like, when, when, when I was a shepherd, like I, I grabbed a, a, a lion by its mane and I grabbed a bear by its hair and I killed it. I did that then and I can defend God's people. Like Good, selfless leaders are willing to put their life on the line to defend the gospel and to defend the people that they're called to lead. I want to read you this verse. It's tucked away in 2 Samuel 23, 11 through 12. It's about a guy named Shema. It's one of my favorite little, little tucked away verses in all of the Old Testament. It's one you might want to put in your back pocket to be encouraged for a long time. And next to him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Hererite. The Philistines gathered at Lai and where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the men led from the Philistine, fled from the Philistines, but he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great victory. Listen, his selfless leadership, this is what I love about Shema. He's just one guy. They would plant all of these crops and the Philistines would come down and they would rob from the Israelites. They would take from the Israelites. And I want you to see this picture. All of the men in Israel were running from the enemy, but this one guy says, I'm going to position myself between a bunch of cowards and a pursuing army, and even if it kills me, I'm going to defend what God has for me and my family. Hear me say this. Are there any dads in the room willing to be Shema this morning? Any moms in the room willing to be Shema this morning? All of culture right now is sweeping in, trying to pervert and ruin our children. You see it everywhere you look. I wonder. I see so many capitulating to culture because we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to upset anybody. We, want to, we don't want to seem like bigots because we cling to the word of God, right? Like we, want to, we don't want to seem unloving, so we won't draw any boundaries. But I wonder if there's any moms or dads or uncles or cousins or friends in the room that will stand up and say, you know what, even if all of culture and all of the world runs away from what God has done, I'll stand here even if it kills me. See, selfless leadership defends Selfless leadership stands when everyone else runs away. A selfless leader provides. A selfless leader defends. A selfless leader helps navigate. 
Psalm 78, 72 says, with upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. Listen, we have this incredible opportunity. We hear conversations on a weekly basis in our families, around our friend groups, where people need direction. They need encouragement. They need hope. They need the truth of God's word spoken into their lives. And so a selfless leader says, you know what? I'm going to go before. I'm going to help navigate. I'm going to risk the relationship. I'm going to talk about some of the speed bumps and some of the pitfalls and maybe some of the red flags that I see in this person's life because I love them enough to risk the relationship and have the conversation. Listen, I had two moments in my life. I shared this with our 9 a.m. crew this morning in the sanctuary. had two moments in my life that stick out to me as I was prepping the sermon, and I remember very, very clearly. When I was about 13 Um, 13 or so, I was kicked out of or asked to not come back to the private Christian school that I was going to. All right? Yeah. I was like, get this dude out of here. All right? He's a sinner. like, you guys are Christian. Anyways, I'm not hurt about that. It's cool. My grandfather picks me up, puts me in the truck. Y'all, I was terrible. I was disrespecting my parents. I was lying all the time. I was stealing stuff. I was, do, I was doing crazy stuff. I was 13. My grandfather picks me up, and, and uh, my grandfather was in the military, so I'm like, I don't know if I'm coming back from this ride. You know what I'm saying? And we just start driving around. He drives me from his, his road, uh, his, his house in East Albany. He just starts driving me towards Sylvester. And now, every once in a while, uh, my, grandf- my, my pa and my ma would take us to uh, the best Dairy Queen on the planet that is in Sylvester, right, and has the best blizzards. And and at the same time, uh, we'd go to Pizza Hut. That was kind of one of the things we did. So he drives me all the way to Sylvester, and we turn around. And he just looks over at me at one point. He's like, what are you doing? He said, what, what, what are you doing with your life? I mean, I'm like 13. I don't know. <laughs> but he's like, TJ, you're disrespecting your parents, and, and I think more of you than this. What are you doing? And that was a, that was a moment for me. That was, that was this moment where I was like, okay, like, there, there's something different here. There's something happening. Someone, someone's trying to help me navigate my life. Like in that moment, he was being selfless. He didn't have to give me his time. He didn't have to give me his attention. He didn't have to risk the relationship, this grandfather-grandson relationship. Instead, he spoke into it to help navigate my life. Give you a second story really quick to help put some skin on this for you. I was 18 years old. I was miserable in school. I was not great at school. Um, You know, I've I've told you before, graduating third in my class, it's kind of awesome until you consider that was third from the bottom, all right? So... Like, this was the class, right? Like, like the struggle of mine was school. So I was frustrated. I was, I was being pretty rebellious. And I call a friend of mine. I'm looking for a way out. Looking for a way out. And my friend Mark Cunningham picks up the phone. And I say, Mark, listen, man, my, my, uh, you know, I just want to go and lead worship and go off to Nashville and be a star and all these things. I was so dumb. <laughs> and I'm looking for him to say, yeah, man, you know what? Like, stick it to the man. You know, leave the house. And he said, you are dumb. And I'm expecting, like, affirmation and a cheerleader. He says, TJ, what are you doing? You're disrespecting your parents, which is dishonoring God. Stop being dumb. Graduate high school because God's got a plan for your life. And I was like, all right, fair enough. I hung up the phone, and I just went back to doing school and and working really hard, and I graduated, and and God's done what he's done in my life. But I think on those moments, as I was prepping this, I looked back at those moments. I was like, man, there was somebody willing to say, hey, TJ, you're on a road that's heading for some rocky terrain. And if you'll just take a left here or a right here, you'll avoid some casualties in your life. A selfless leader is someone that does not sit back and say, you know what, I was, one young, I was young once. Let my son, let my daughter sow those wild oats. Let them do their thing. Let them learn the school of hard knocks. No, a good selfless leader says, let me help you navigate life. Not to coddle, not to insulate but let me speak truth in love. Let me me call out some of those red flags that I hear. Let me call you up to be who God called you to be. A selfless leader will navigate for the people they love. Last point under the first point is this. This is my favorite. A selfless leader loves. A selfless leader loves. Exodus 32, this is one of the most striking verses in Scripture. There's two places in Scripture that really grip my heart. I'm going to share both of them, but this one I'm going to read the whole thing because it grips me. 
Kind of give you a backstory of what's going on. Moses has been spending time with God in his glory, receiving like all of this information, all of this incredible, all of this experience with, with Yahweh. Like Moses has been doing this thing. The children of Israel have been down in the valley just kind of hanging out, doing some weird stuff, building a golden calf, like dancing and worshiping, just getting crazy, right? Like they're losing their minds. Moses comes down off the mountain. He's like, oh my God. Guys, you have sinned. Like, you created an idol. So Moses goes back up the mountain. And check, this, check out this conversation he has with God. The next day, Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Listen to this. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not... Please blot me out of your book that you have written. What kind of love must Moses have had for the people that he was called to shepherd that he would stand before God and say, God, they have sinned, they deserve judgment, but if you're going to blot them out, blot me out. I love them too much to see them go. What did Paul say later? Paul said this, I would go to hell for you. I would be cut off from the kingdom for you if I could. And I wonder this morning, do we love people enough to say, God, even if, it, even if it meant costing me everything that they come to know you, Lord, love them, Jesus. Like, what would it look like for us as a church? I know that you say, teacher, this is incredibly for, and it is because a selfless leader loves. A selfless leader does not care about themselves. A selfless leader says, Lord, you can have all of this stuff. You can have all of my life, all of my wealth, all of my goods. If someone would just come to know you. Oh God, if you're not going to save Tifton, blot my name out. Can I be honest? I don't love y'all that much. I don't. The idea of taking your place in hell, I have not cultivated or experienced or been graced that kind of love. But I look at the scriptures and I say, God, give me a heart for my church like this. God, give me a heart for the people that don't think like me and vote like me and love like me and look like me. God, give me a heart that loves so much so that I would be willing to be cut off so that you could go in. God is looking for selfless leaders who are willing to kick the doors open to the party and to be pushed out of the way so that others might know Jesus. And I'm not there, <laughs> but I want to be. I want this heart, I want to cultivate this culture. I want our church to be known as this kind of church. We don't care about our preferences, our stuff, our buildings, all that will return to rubble anyways. All we care about, all we care about is seeing one more person embrace the atoning work of King Jesus and all that he did on the cross. So God, make us selfless leaders. You say, TJ, how, how does that happen? How do we get there? How do we begin to take the first step? Point number two. Leading selflessly means that we begin to oversee the people God has trusted us with faithfully. What did he say in chapter five of First Peter? Exercising oversight. So what does that mean? It means that you and I have to walk around willing to correct people that we love. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So if you say you want to cultivate this atmosphere, this culture of leading selflessly, how do I begin to do that? Be willing to correct people that are walking uh, separate of their calling or walking in an identity that does not belong to them. You see someone that calls himself a Christian living, responding, speaking in a way that is unchristian, be willing to correct them. Correct them in love. Risk the relationship. But as quick as you are to correct, be just as quick to encourage. You say, we want to have this environment. Listen, a good leader corrects the people that they love rather than just criticizing them. 
1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So be quick to encourage. You say, I want to be a selfless leader. How do I do that? Be willing to correct, but then be willing to encourage, to lift somebody up. Like, don't fall in love with pointing out someone else's errors. Fall in love with seeing them restored to the kingdom of God and encouraged and comforted and celebrated again. We established a rule here on staff about five years ago. We were sitting in a staff meeting, and, and, and we determined that you would no longer be able to bring a critique to our staff table unless you could offer a solution with it. You weren't allowed just to complain. <laughs> because we're conditioned. We live in a culture where, I mean, we walk into a restaurant, and the lights are too dim or they're too bright, the music's too loud or it's, it's too low, and like we're, we're conditioned to critique, Right? I wasn't talking about this room. I was talking about a restaurant, but if the shoe fits, I guess, right? The food's too hot or too cold. They took too long or it came out too fast. My drink's too flat or it's not. Like we've been conditioned to be self-centered and to criticize. But hear me say this. A good selfless leader will correct quickly, but they will quickly encourage. They will quickly build up the people who have been entrusted to them. They will be slow to anger and they will be generous in mercy. Listen to Colossians 3.13. Bear with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Listen, a great selfless leader never hangs the offense over someone's head. A great selfless leader never enjoys shaming someone in their mistakes or their sin or reminding them of how much they messed up way back when. That is a terrible, selfish leader that does that. That is not a selfless, Christ-centered leader. You say, well, TJ, how do you get there? How, how can that be? How can I be that kind of selfless leader? Look at the cross. When you remember, when I, listen, when I remember that it was my sin that drove the nails through the precious lamb's hands, when it was my sin that ferociously ground the thorns into his forehead, that it was my sin that thrust the spear into his side, that it was my sin that wrapped the cat of nine tails around his body and tore his flesh off, that it was my sin that spit on him and humiliated him publicly, when I realize that he has given forgiveness for all that I gave, how can I then withhold forgiveness? forgiveness from any of you. And here's the question, how can you withhold forgiveness from anyone? That's how you become generous in mercy and lead selflessly with abundant amount with an abundant amount of mercy. You stare at the cross and realize all that you've been forgiven for. Two more points I'm going to leave you alone. <laughs> Hang with me. We're almost there. Point number three, any submission of leadership should be the benefit of those who we are tasked to lead, not for our own glory or selfish gain. Great selfless leaders lead for the benefit of the people behind them, not for their own notoriety, not for their own wealth, not for the pat on the back, and not for the accolades. Someone that leads for the sake of the stage or someone that leads for the sake of being seen or someone that leads for the sake of gaining has fallen into a wicked trap that will pervert their soul and end up in a downfall caused by pride. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. So this is, this is how we want to think of this as a church. The reason that we lead... The reason that we do the hard work of relationship, the reason that we call someone out in their sin, the reason we encourage someone, the, the reason that we want to be selfless leaders is so that the generation behind us turn into selfless leaders. The reason that we want to evangelize and discipleship, the reason that we want to push our preferences and conveniences to the side and center in on Jesus is not for our own self. It's not for us. It's not so that we're patted on the back. It's not so that we're celebrated. It's so that someone after us might reap the benefit of our faithful leadership in Christ. When we lead selfless, selflessly, we are not leading for our own glory or for selfish gain. We are leading in the shadow of an empty cross and an empty grave. And here's the last point I want to give you this morning.
leading selflessly will bring you to the same end as the one you're following. If I'm following you, I've committed to go wherever you go and to end up at the same destination. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So hear me say this, leading selflessly means hearing the gospel call of Jesus when Jesus said, follow me, and then realizing that his way was a way to the cross. That the end goal, the prize for my followership is identifying with Christ in his blessing and his suffering. So, TJ, what are you trying to get at this morning? I'll make it as simple as I can. If our leadership does not bring people to the feet of Jesus, then we have taken them, taken them on an empty journey. You might can lead somebody to get rich. You might can work on them in their fi- with their finances. might lead them to prosperity and generational wealth. If you don't lead them to the feet of Jesus, you've led them on an empty journey. You might be a teacher. You might gift your students a craft or a skill or a certain set of knowledge. But in the end, if we do not lead people to the feet of Jesus, we have taken them on an empty journey. Listen, I might be a pastor. He might be a Sunday school leader. We might throw out some self-help, some self-discipleship, some self-awareness stuff and make people better people. But if I do not lead you to the feet of Jesus, I've taken you on an empty journey. Dads, moms, you might get them in the right school, on the right sports team. You might finagle your way into the right friend group or do whatever you need to do so they're socially accepted or however you feel about that. But if you don't lead them to the feet of Jesus, you've taken them on an empty journey. Husbands and wives, you might provide and supply each other everything that you want in terms of intimacy or finances and all the things that make a happy marriage, but if you aren't leading each other to the feet of Jesus, you're taking each other on an empty journey. If our leadership does not bring people to the feet of Jesus... And then we're just taking them on an empty journey. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to find myself at the cross. Amen? I want to find myself at the feet of Jesus with a whole host of people behind me that I've loved and provided for and corrected and encouraged and forgiven. And I hope that would be true of you in your life. This morning, I want to pray for you and we'll respond in song. We call this a response time so that you can have a minute to sit with the things that you've heard and just say something back to God. Respond. If you're anything like me, when I read some of these points, all I can really say back to God is, Lord, help me. (laughs) Lord, stir me. Lord, change me. So we want to give you that opportunity this morning as we respond. I'm going to pray for you, and then they'll, they'll sing over you. Father, thank you for the gospel that our hope is in you, Jesus, and in you alone. You were the greatest selfless leader of all time. You knew the cross was before you, and you endured. You carried all of our sin, all of our hurts, all of our habits, all of our hang-ups, every one of them. And you nailed them to the cross, declaring victory over them forevermore. So Jesus, this morning, help us to follow you. Help us to give you all of our yeses, God. Lord, help help us to lay all of our lives at the foot of Calvary and do whatever you want with our lives, Jesus. God, we we want to declare as a church, where you go, we'll go. What you say, we'll say. Who you love, we will love. Who you serve, we will serve. Lord, help us find ourselves at your feet with a whole crowd of people following us there. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand with me as we respond? It goes like this. 
Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Come on. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more, oh, for grace to trust him. See, we need grace, because we need grace to trust. great sobering word we had this morning. Let me just remind you of a few things and we'll pray to dismiss, but remember about summer small groups, the 519 Gospel Choir, and then BBS in a couple of weeks. So let's pray as a faith family and we'll, we'll go. God, we just heard such a powerful message, Jesus. Lord, what, what servant leadership truly looks like. Lord, of, of considering those around us more significant than ourselves. And Jesus, we have the perfect example of yourself by living the life that we were supposed to live and dying the death that we all deserve. And so, Jesus, may your words this morning through Pastor TJ not rest on empty ears, but Jesus, transform us this morning. As we leave this morning, help us to be a changed people, to love the people that you called to place around us. And we'll be forever grateful. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen.